Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by plants. plants. Today we bring to you episode 501, Hope Makes the World Go Round with Dr. Ishan. In this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk with Dr. Ishan Shivanand about why hope makes the world go round. Ishan shares his unique perspective, having been born into a monastery and a plant-based lifestyle. He emphasizes the importance of training our minds to be happy and how people need more hope in their lives. Through the story of Buddha and the hope of enlightenment, he explains how bringing ourselves closer to enlightenment and understanding what self-love truly means, we can discover the tools for cultivating a more hopeful and transforming life. Dr. Ishan, founder of Yoga of Immortals, is a mental health professor and researcher with specialization in meditative modalities. Scientifically validated YOI protocols are currently being actively integrated into diverse sectors, including healthcare, educational institutions, sports, military, and the corporate world. This was a fascinating episode with Dr. Ishan, very enlightening and inspiring. I'm sure you're going to find the same. Enjoy and share it out. Hey guys, guess what? I have a new book coming soon. It's called I Am a Courageous Cub. So for those of you that gave me support with I Am a Peaceful Goldfish, thank you so much. You can get I Am a Courageous Cub right now by pre-ordering it on Amazon or checking out the link in our show notes at plantrainers.com. And now for a moment of gratitude. I'm grateful for the time that we spend as a family, but I am also very, very grateful for the time that I could spend one-on-one with each of my kids too. I'm grateful for episodes and guests like this who share moments of hope and inspiration, and hopefully you will find that with this episode as well. Ishan, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Thank you so much, ma'am. The pleasure is all mine. We're excited to talk to you. And before we do, we wanted to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for a session I was just taking before coming here. It was with uh, HCPs that work in the hospice sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were just conversing about the care that they give to a person when he's about to leave his body. And uh, the amount of introspection that comes when you are giving care to somebody who's departing. And I believe uh, when we see a lot of death, it just makes us grateful for life. So I'm so very grateful for life and being here and talking to you. That's great. Our daughter actually recently expressed interest in hospice work uh, when she gets older. And I, I think it's really important work that people that that people do. And it's probably not given enough credit for for what people have to go through and how they have to find the positivity in life and, and the gratitude in life because their days can be very difficult. Yes, ma'am. Death, death is like uh, taxes. We, we, we don't want to talk about it. It, it's, <laughs> it has to be dealt with when it is, has to be uh, dealt with. And I think we should be more aware uh, of, because if we look at uh, Eastern traditions like Jainism, Buddhism, even Hinduism, death plays a very key role in, in the philosophy and helping a, a person evolve. Because uh, if, we, if a person is clinging on to anxieties or fears of, or anger, then, then a person is reminded of his death, that it's all temporary. You know, eventually the body is dropped like a piece of cloth is dropped. So let us focus our attention on that which is most important rather than that which you would not want to take to your deathbed. And uh, I think that needs to happen a lot more. Uh, So conversations of death are not just to a person who's on the hospice, but every single person who's fit, fine and healthy as well, because that will allow us to let go of what we need to. I was going to say, if we let go of the fear, do you think we could live better? Yes, madam. Uh, More than let go of the fear, I think just an acceptance of the inevitable will definitely help us uh, live better. I also think people don't really live in the moment and they 
don't think about being grateful for what they have and focus on what they don't have sometimes. And I think that's something that people need to do a lot more of. Definitely. If people can uh, appreciate what they have and uh, uh, then it, it becomes an understanding of our own self. So I teach a lot of meditation and uh, that is my core competency. I help people meditate and I help people go inside. And I try to educate people on a fact that we can't control situations, we can't control things. The only thing we can control is how we react. So our own mind. And if we can understand our mind, then we can control a lot of the emotions that we are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. If we connect our emotions to things that we have, external factors, then our emotions would always be volatile because things can be stolen, things can be taken away, things can be snatched and, and, and things are vast. So always we will be on a search, on a quest. But if slowly we start to train ourselves and educate ourselves that joy is not coming from external things, it is just a projection of our own mind, then a person starts to let go of anxieties and fears because he realizes that everything is a projection. Even fear is a projection. Uh, when I'm working with people, I, I, I meet people sometimes who have phobias. And phobias are sometimes very precise, very certain, very specific, and sometimes they're just weird. So I was working with, with somebody who had a phobia of cockroaches. And logically, if I try to explain to them, cockroach, it doesn't bite, it doesn't sting, it's not venomous, and you could just step on it, but logic does not apply. You know, cockroach is just a very benign, nonsensical thing that irritates us. But our mind projects it to be something like Godzilla. So the mind is playing a very, very powerful role and we can have all the uh, luxuries under the blue sky and our mind can be telling us that no, we are not successful and we'll be sad. But if we can train our mind, then we can be happy with the, the bread and butter that we eat. And I'm not saying we should just eat the bread. I'm saying that we should train our mind to be a little bit more aware and mindful. Yeah, I, I think that that's the key is training the mind. We allow ourselves to do what's easy on a regular basis. And we're so busy doing the work for our jobs or doing the work for our children, but we don't always do the mind, do the mindset work to, to help us, to help us go. And we'll come back to that because we wanted to, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about hope and self-love today. Before we get into that, can you share with, Usually the first question we ask guests after asking the moment of gratitude is, how did you find a plant-based lifestyle? Your story is completely unique from anybody we've ever had on before. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Yes, madam. So uh, I was raised, I, I, was, so I was born in a monastic environment. My father was the head of an ashram, which is like a monastery. In, in the western part of India, Rajasthan. And it's, it's secluded, it's near a desert. And uh, I was born and I raised there. And the lifestyle was very uh, organic, very spiritual, very meditative. So it was the only thing that I knew. And uh, the question that you said that we asked that, how did you land into a plant-based lifestyle? Uh, that was the only truth that was given to me. And, and, and that was the secret to success of all the monks that were around me, everybody who was so very happy. It was a way that taught us how to live with the flow of nature and never to go against it. So, uh, so yes, that's how I stumbled upon it through birth. I stumbled upon it through birth. Yeah, so yes, definitely the first person who who had that answer for us. And... I mean, it, this is probably a leading question, but now outside of the monastery doing the work that you did, I assume that you're very influenced by your your upbringing and the and the way you lived as for the first twenty years of life and how you continue to live in in those further years. Yes, it's like uh, 
how a veteran friend of mine was trying to explain to me that you can leave the army, but the army doesn't leave you. Mm. The training that you've gone through, it, it just uh, seeps into every single part of your life, how you think, how you live, how you sleep, how you eat. And, and it's, it, it was 20 years of my life. 20 years of my uh, life and, and, and the most impressionable age, which was my childhood, my, my youth, when my hormones hit. So I was taught to think in a certain manner. I was taught to observe reality in a certain manner. I was taught to react to adversity in a certain manner. And I think uh, that is something that has carried on no matter where I go. I was taught to see people in a certain manner. And I think that that compassion is is something that that is acquired because nobody is born with that compassion human beings are human beings and and there are a lot of comparisons between human beings and and biology and and zoology so all these things that we are talking about spirituality uh, or or compassion a lot of it is acquired behavior we can train ourselves to to live a certain kind of life and the beauty is that if we spend enough time training ourselves, then no matter where we are, we could be in a monastery in, in, in a desert in western part of India, or we could be in a nice fancy uh, place in North America. We are still ourselves. And, and that's what I, I tell all my students, that this state, this peace of mind that you are looking for, if you spend enough time on training yourself, it is a goal that is achievable. And, and again, coming back to that, that training yourself. So when we were talking earlier this week and thinking about some topics that we wanted to talk about here, uh, I asked you what you thought was missing from people's lives. And your answer was hope. Tell us more about why that was your answer. So if we look at a lot of philosophers uh, of the 19th century they talk about the concept of nihilism and uh, even if we look at 10,000 years ago uh, of, of the life of kings and queens uh, let us let us talk about Buddha Buddha is a prince so I'm, I'm talking I'm quoting his story Buddha is a prince that's lived this life that's lived this amazing life and he has been in a bubble. And one day he wants to come out of his palace. He wants to come out of his bubble. He wants to come out of his luxuries. So he goes with his charioteer for the first time out of his bubble. And the first thing that he sees is, he sees a old man. And, and suddenly Buddha is shocked. He goes in a, and, and presently he's Siddharth. He's not the Buddha. He's just a random prince. And he sees a old man for the first time and he's shocked. He goes through cognitive dissonance because all he knows is this handsome, strong self. And he looks at, at that person and he asks his charioteer, what is this guy's problem? How is he so frail, so weak? And the charioteer explains that that's normal, that's old age. And, and Siddharth Buddha asks, will it happen to me? Charioteer says, yes, it's going to happen to you. And then Buddha is just shocked. And then uh, he sees a sick man and the same question, will this happen to me? And the charioteer says, yeah, that, that can happen to you. That, that can happen to everyone. And then he sees a dying man. And then Buddha is afraid and he says, will that happen to me? And the chariot looks at him like a doofus. And he said, yeah, that is going to happen to you. What kind of a bubble are you in? And then when that happens, the first thing that Buddha goes through is an existential crisis. And every single Eastern scripture talks about this existential crisis that comes once our bubble is burst. And our bubble can be burst through realization of knowledge or truth, or it can be burst through a loss of a loved one, or it can be burst through sickness, or it can be lost through depression or mental health disorder. But eventually, all bubbles are burst and this existential crisis comes. A loss of hope. And generally, when this loss of hope comes, is two things can happen. 
either i start to live a nihil nihilistic lifestyle that oh nothing has meaning anymore so i will use my life just as a pursuit to enjoy and engage my senses to engage my tongue to engage my ears to engage my eyes but the more nihilistic i become the more i sedate myself with all the luxuries that are around me irrespective of what it will do to my body the sadder i am going to become but if at that time when my bubble is burst and i look at life with a little bit more hope and i try to use this existential crisis as a form of ammunition to delve deeper to dig deeper to find who i really am then rather than nihilism this crisis can lead to enlightenment a much higher state of awareness a much higher state of awakening and positivity so i do believe that nowadays the youth are having access to so much of information and once so much of information through social media comes then we also start to feel like buddha we think everybody on the internet is a troll we start to have a, a, like when i was a child growing up in the monastery i didn't know anything and today my son he's 8 year old in north america studying he knows so much because he has access to so much information but the more information he knows he is like that buddha going through that crisis that ah i know this i know that and nothing has meaning and i don't want people to go into that nihilism and i want them to have a hope to think that yes the world is a good place the world is a nice place and yes there is some chaos around us but there is also the scope of enlightenment and if we allow ourselves the hope of knowing that good things can happen to us then maybe we are crazy enough to make them happen and that's why i said hope so how do we get people or help people understand that point and have them focus on being more hopeful being more positive and bringing trying to bring themselves more towards enlightenment one can be a curated time with my own self a cu- when i say curated time i i mean like for example when we are doing meditations one is we just do an observational meditation when we observe our breath or we observe our thoughts and uh, sometimes observational meditation like mindfulness can become detrimental because when i start to observe my thoughts all i see is a monkey doing backflips and that can cause more anxiety uh at the end rather than what i have to begin with so at those times when i am hyper intelligent hyper aware uh is is we spend some curated time with our own self curated time is the easiest way to explain is a form of guided meditation where we are going through set protocols either through the breath or through the body or through the awareness and what this curated time does is it allows our mind to spend time in our own body because many of the times i have seen there is a cognitive uh, uh, disconnection of the body and the mind people are living they are there but they are not there they are sitting with their family but they are not sitting with their family they are not grounded into the present moment and that is why a lot of the times when we are even offering the solution or offering the suggestion it just goes shwee and you must have seen you're talking to a person you're talking to them and they're moving their heads but you know knock 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 they're not there the person you're trying to reach is not available at the moment you could wait or dial again later the message is there but when we spend that curated time a person is forced to come back to the body and when that happens that is the moment when they are open to suggestion advice and even love so i would i would recommend that that curated time with the body yes will that bring more self love it begins with self awareness mm. uh because right now self love is an 
abstract concept what am i loving who am i and if i don't know who i am then what am i loving it is just a, a punching in thin air so with awareness i start to know who i am it starts with self acceptance self awareness and then eventually self love going to take a little break because i don't know if you are a parent if you have a kid in your life that you love if you know somebody who's bringing a kid into the world my new book i am a courageous cub is perfect because sometimes it's easy to feel discouraged anxious or scared but when that happens little kids moving their body and using their imagination can really get their confidence going can get them trying new things and can get them to be courageous and you know what i know some adults who need to be extra courageous too so if we could get little kids practicing those skills as young ones they'll be better at it when they're old ones so please head over to amazon or the link in our show notes at plantaintrainers.com and pre-order i am a courageous cub right now it's my second book and i'm super excited to share it with you all thank you so much for your support and now back to the show and will people have more hope if they have more self-awareness and self-love or are they connected hope definitely yes and i i would say they would have more hope for others as well and for the world as well too because see hope is a is a wonderful thing uh, a mother is taking care of the child even though the child is puking all over her and pooping on her nice table yet the mother is hopeful that one day i will be able to get more out of this relationship hope makes the world go round a person may be unhealthy yet he is investing time and money and patience into going to the gym with the hope that maybe one day i will have a six pack app the more hope we have the more effort we put and the day we become hopeless we stop giving effort and there is the hope we have for the self the hope we have for the family the hope we have for our professional life and the hope we have for the world around us our civic duty is also dependent upon the projection of that hope and that same hope can be said is positivity so you know positive mindset a positive mindset that yes my family is good and we are evolving together and they are becoming better whereas a negative mindset that my family are a bunch of dodos and it is my bad karma that i am just born with them and that is why when i'm trying to give resilience training uh, coaching to students which i think is is very very important today that stress is going to happen it's a it's a reality of life how we can train ourselves to react to stress in a certain manner that it doesn't harm us so we become more more resilient because resilient literally is a conscious effort in training us so this is our life our life is going our quality of life if if i explain to you life as a graph this is the age and this is the quality of life and our thought process is that as our age progresses the quality of life should increase but then something traumatic happens and our quality of life goes down so how resilient we are will decide how easily or how sooner we will get back to our life trajectory to what it was before the trauma to what it is presently if we are not resilient something will happen and we will remain here you know sometimes people can't come out of a breakup so they are there sometimes people can't come out of the trauma they are still there and through meditative tools through philosophical tools through spiritual tools the whole objective is we fall but then we rise up mm-hmm. and that is why hope is important because hope equals the effort we will put in helping ourselves rise up again and hope can be created hope can be taught it can be taught to us through spiritual tools it can be taught to us through loving and compassionate tools simple tools like what we were doing in the session before gratitude that is a tool that cultivates hope another thing that we can add is just getting up in the morning and love and kindness where do we want to project love and kindness 
maybe to our family we think about them loving and kindness to the body that is something we can practice that can cultivate good hope that i love myself i love my body just just saying it as a mantra and trying to feel that emotion and projecting it or loving and kindness to the future self one very beautiful exercise to cultivate hope can be we can sit meditate and just create this image of our future self how would we see ourselves 10 years from now how healthy do we need to be how happy do we need to be how rich do we need to be and then we are projecting love and kindness to that future self as we walk towards it and that walks towards us so every day is a better day because i am closer and closer to my goal i think that's a very powerful conversation thank you so much for sharing that with us if uh, our listeners want to reach out and connect with you learn more about what you're doing where you're doing it how you're doing it where can they reach out uh, i'm available on linkedin my name is ishan shivanand so i think i'm on all the social medias as well but uh, yes and they can connect and ev- uh, in all the medias everything that i'm going to do uh, they can join and one more thing that i do which i would really uh, appreciate if your listeners can find time to join is i do these weekly uh, meditation seminars that are asynchronous in nature uh, where online people come together and uh, the meditations are happening and even synchronous in nature so synchronous is biweekly where um, once in two weeks i come online and through this medium zoom anybody who's anywhere can join it is free for people and uh, it can benefit every single person and about 7 to 8000 people join these live sessions and uh, maybe if we can share the link to those sessions and i think your listeners can benefit from them it's a very nice community of people who hope and believe that they are becoming better every day i think that's what our listeners want they they hope and believe that they are becoming better every day so i do hope they check it out we will put that in the show notes over at plantchainers.com you told me how many countries are normally represented when you do that how, how many countries are are represented when you do those meditations a lot of them madam so almost <laughs> all of asia and uh, all of europe and north america we are still uh, uh, penetrating into south america and uh, in in asia also almost all of asia uh, including the middle east and southeast asia and africa so a lot of representation there mm-hmm. and uh, now since i started work in north america north america is easy only three countries but yeah south america is where slowly and slowly people are, are are gathering and sometimes language becomes a barrier but wherever english is being spoken we always find them uh, appreciating what is being taught thank you so much and just before we go also tell people about the cows how many cows have you rescued i will tell how many cows we have right now yeah 3000 Mm-hmm. so wow. these are the cows that uh, so uh, uh, in developing countries there is a problem of poverty and uh, many times farmers who practice animal husbandry once the cow stops being productive it's going to the butcher and uh, those are the cows that we rescue uh, and uh, presently we have 3000 cows in in about 1000 acres in the western part of rajasthan but over time and this is a work that we have been doing since since the last uh, 20 years and uh, sometimes the cows survive we try to give it as much care as we can sometimes the cows are too sick or abused to to survive but at least the end of life has been kind to them but over the time i think it, it it's it's countless countless but, yeah but we, i want you to imagine 3000 cows presently and there's always a number of cows going and cows coming but yes i think if i if i had to put a number to it a conservative estimate would be uh, not um i if i say 100000 it would be still a, a good ballpark mm mm-hmm. wow 
Amazing. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for that work. And thank you for the work that you're doing for the whole planet. And uh, we look forward to people joining your your free meditation. I look forward to joining it. And thank you so much for being a guest today on the Plant Trainers Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It was a pleasure conversing with both of you. And uh, thank you for having me and my regards to all of your listeners. Thank you all so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. We want to make sure that you subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or any other podcasting platform. We really appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it really helps other people find us just like you did. Thanks so much to our patrons. To become a patron, visit us at patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference in the quality of the show. And don't forget to connect with us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at planttrainers.com for awesome recipes, a list of our services, and of course, our latest podcast. We encourage you to email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so that we can help you improve your quality of life through nutrition and fitness. So we hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and, and have, have a, a healthy, healthy day. day. Or is that too corny? It's a little cheesy.